I start to to speak about the application of a spectral phaser to hyperspectral imaging. And you know, contrary what happened with the with the um, with the flim, which basically uh, require you know very specialized you know detectors. Well, very specialized specialized detectors and require you know special car and require a customized microscope. Hyperspectral imaging is almost available in any confocal microscope nowadays with different kind of configuration, and we will see. And uh, but not that many application of hyperspectral imaging are out, are out there. You know, we, we don't use we, we don't use much hyperspectral uh, models in, in, in the in the in the confocal microscope. And my belief is because we don't know what to do with the data. And uh, and and I'm convinced again that the spectral phasers are you know a very easy and intuitive way to take advantage of hyperspectral imaging. So I will not cover many much more about you know the, the the mixing size of the hyperspectral imaging. I will give a couple of examples at the end of the talk, but I will rather prefer to show how power could be taking the spectra and using the phaser when you have fluorophores that can change properties, you know where they are, and you cannot predict this this spectra fluorescent in different situations. So the regular and mixing protocols does not work, right? Okay, so I started working with spectral phaser during my PhD, and at that time, Enrico, again, uh, told me, well, Lionel, why you are not doing phasers in Europe? I said, well, no, Enrico, I don't have a flame box. I don't have, a, you know, all the technology to say, well, no, no, yes, you have everything. Uh, the only thing that you need is a microscope that can do spectra. I said, what is that? Well, I will try to show you that, you know, we learn now that, if you have a decay, we can transform the data in the phaser. And the key here is to having basically a period, right? Period in time, period in degrees, whatever. Uh, but then we can also have periods, which are basically the range of the spectra that you can collect. And if you have a spectra and you do the proper com transformation, you can put this spectra on a phaser. And the position in the phaser, we will see that has relies on some characteristic of this spectra, you know, the width, the, the center of mass. Uh, and if you have another spectra, which is redder and broader, you see that it's, it's shift counterclockwise, uh, so longer phase starting from here, and it's near to the center because it's broader, and we will learn all this rule. So basically, he convinced me that, yes, we don't have a universal cycle in the spectral phasor, Spectral phaser does not have universal cycle, and this is a mathematical reason. But you know, an easy uh, way to to understand that is we always in fluorescent lifetime start from the same point because it's when the pulse come. But in the spectra, you can have any shape. There is no pulse. There is no time of arrival of the photon. It's just the you know color photons in a way, right? And how is how the the broader how shift they are in the different range of the spectra. So you you will have basically a four quarters or so two pi phase of. Uh, so basically to acquire the, the hyperspectral imaging, which is an X and Y with lambda box. So we have at the same image at different wavelength. We rely basically in some optics. Um, can be greetings, can be prism, or can be some more advanced, you know, uh, uh, tools that combine some of these one, like quasars that are in the microscope that we will use in the practical session. But then you can collect the spectra using a single photomultiplier, but collecting with a slit or with other optical parts, small regions of the spectra. So you need to obtain sub images of different wavelengths step by step. Or if you are lucky enough, or if you have the money enough to buy a microscope that has an array, you can collect the whole range of the spectra in a single shot, for instance, in 32 channels, which is the demo that size brought for, for all of us in the practical session, and we will take advantage of it. And this technology is all commercial. There are many different microscopes. Size has from 710 to 980 
32 channels parallel. Uh, Leica, Nikon, Olympus, and some others rely on different combination of collecting by steps. And then there are some camera base, which are the same. You use the camera as a chip and you project the spectra of emission and you collect with very high resolution, up to nanometer resolution, the spectra. Or there are some other microscope, uh, custom built microscope like this one that uh, it was in the LFD and I have the chance to work for, for a long time with a spectrograph, which is very good and very sensitive. Moreover, uh, in the in the last five, six years, uh, Sasha Dibornikov and Enrico Graton has developed this idea in which when we do the phasor, we need to take the spectra and we transform this spectra in this new space, which is the frequency space, right? The phasor, the Fourier transformation. But in principle, we will learn that we can do this transformation just in optics, not with mathematics. And if you have the right filters, you can do spectral imaging, not by acquiring different points in the spectra, by transforming the data to the spectral phase. And I will try to explain at the end of the talk. But how will this look like? Yes, we have from the single, the same image, many channels, and this is how the uh, size present the data. You start from uh, 415 and you end up in 691 in my, in my uh, configuration. And then size use this, uh, you know, color code for the different channels. So if you have in a pixel a maximum, right, you collect, you see, if you look, there is some sort of spectra here because you go from down up to here and then go down again. If your pixel has the maximum in this channel, it will give you, I don't know, this channel will give you blue. But if it's here, the maximum it will be green. If it's here, it will be red. It will generate a pseudo color image based on the maximum. This doesn't help you much because you don't know if you have more than one fluorophore, right? It's only the maximum, right? It can be more than one fluorophore. Uh, so to analyze many fluorophores, there are there were many different uh, uh, applications of mathematic approach to split the fluorescent coming from uh, the spectral uh, that you collect. And this is interesting when we have troubles to uh, through the bleeding between one channel to another. If you collect the spectra, you don't care about bleeding because you collect the whole spectra. Now, the challenge is how you know that this spectra in black here is composed by, I don't know, 50 50 of this or 70, 75 25 or any other combination. Well, this method, like classification analysis, principal component analysis, or linear mixing, relies on having information of your fluorophores and then setting an equation for each channel telling, well, if I have this uh, fluorophore uh, in, in solution, this combination of fluorophore in solution, and I recover this spectra, you know, the equation tell you that in this, in this, in this, in this, in this channel, I have that amount of percent of the fluorophore over this other, right? And this is the regular, the convolution approach. They done, they, they can do this in different ways. But for all for all the application, you need a model. You need to know which are these spectra to propose that you have two, you have three, that the contribution and the channel one, three, four, whatever, is this or that. With the phase or plot, we don't rely on models. We do the transformation, and this is how it shaped a new formula because you have different space, not time. It's now lambda. But you can calculate again the integral of you know the spectra uh, multiplied by the cosine or the sine, so G and S, and then you normalize by the total intensity, and you can also quanti uh, uh, calculate more harmonics in changing this N here. So the spectral phasor analysis is a model free, does not require pure knowledge, combine traditional spectral analysis with phasor analysis, is doable in cubet but also in imaging. And for imaging, it has a lot of power because you will need to analyze hundreds of hundred or thousand of thousand of pixels, pixels and en enable, and this is the application that I want to show all of you, the uh, understanding of molecular environment. So this is a, a method that was developed by uh, Fred Woni at the Ken Harrison lab in Europe 
in 2012, and we used it a lot and expanded for more component, etc., as I will show in the lecture. So how it works? If we simulate three spectra with different maximum and with different full width at the Hall maximum, how broad they are. If we transformated them, the blue will come earlier because it's closer to the beginning of the period, and it will have a distance from the center, which is farther than any other because it's narrow, the spectra. So as greener become or red become, you see that it's going toward one revolution counterclockwise, right? And the distance, you see, this is the broader spectra, is going to be closer to the center. So again, by looking at this phasor, now I can tell you that this fluorophore is redder than this fluorophore without even see the spectra, just by understanding the rules of the phasor. And I can tell you more. I can tell you that this spectra is even wider than this one because it's closer to the center. The other thing that I can use is the linear combination properties, because now if I have something between these two points, I am sure that it's a mixture between these two components, and I can recall you know, the fraction be because I can measure the distance between here and here and here and here, as we learned from the fluorescent lifetime. This is also true for three components. So we can use this analysis to unmix three component, spectral component, very easily using the spectral phasor rules. And we can do what we learned from the fluorescent lifetime imaging, which is the reciprocity principle, which is very useful for imaging. We can go to the phasor, select ratio of interest, and this were basically a, 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 an image of two by two with three different spectra, each of them pure component and one is a mixture. And you will see that if you highlight where are you know these pixels here, you can go back and see, okay, yes, this pixel here is the green here, and this here is here. So I can use this back and forth. So this is a very powerful thing. So what are the considerations we need to have when we do spectral imaging? Well, saturation is a big deal because if you saturate your detector, the spectral shape can change. And I did this experiment to demonstrate that. If you have this case, is is cells labeled with a fluorescent dye, is is as Agdan, and we will see more about Agdan. And you not you don't have saturation, you have small saturation, and you have high saturation. And I can see here the histogram. I can show you in in twelve bit. <coughs> here is severe saturation, and this is a little bit <coughs> sorry saturation. If we place cursors at fixed in the phasor, and we have the cloud here you see that the recovery pseudocolor image that we got is different. And it's different because the pixels that were here now already are in another place in the phaser. So they change the place in the phaser because the shape of the phaser changed and the phaser position is sensitive to maximum and width of the spectrum. The other important thing is signal to noise. <clears throat> signal to noise is all, always important in any microscopy measurement, but with the spectra it's very important because you can eventually be attempt to increase the resolution of the window. And I did this experiment in, with the same logic. I placed the cursor at the same position and I changed the resolution of the collection of the spectra while I keep more or less at the same amount of count. And you see that you know, you can change a lot, you know, the resolution and a lot the noise because of changing on the, uh, on the amount of light that I allow to pass through these wi little windows. And somehow, because, you know, sensitivity of the detector, you know, amount of light that you collect, the 32 channels that is the array that we will use in the practical session is somehow the best, where the cloud is packed and the uh, data is well organized in, in the phaser and in the linear combination. So again, if you have the chance to have many, many more channels, eventually it may not help you. Uh, and between 16 and 32, honestly speaking, there is not that much change. So again, if you don't need, if you need to, to take a spectra in steps, 
eventually having 32 is too much time to take and you can renounce to you know some channels without losing that much resolution in the spectral phase or analysis so the first application that i want to to mention is the study of the photophysics of this probe which is the dynami dimethylamino naphthalene probes which which was a dye synthesized by gregorio weber and Faye ferris <coughs> and they show us yesterday this dye and this dye is so powerful that just with your eyes you can see here a process a molecular process uh, a, a very you know nanometric level so you have here prodan so the dye with a substitution of a propyl group here uh which depending if you are in a in a in a um low low temperature or oh, thank you low temperature or high temperature it will relax the water around the dye and it will change the spectra it will change really seriously the spectra no? from blue to, to green right but the photophysics of this proof is, is very very nice you know and in the ground state it can get you know excited and if you <clears throat> after excitation it enlarge this dipole moment and this dipole moment is used to sense the environment if there is no you know uh, uh change in polarity or you know if there is no molecular structure that can be relaxed like solvent uh the dye will emit but if there is it will spend some of the energy in reorganizing these water molecules and while the these water molecules are reorganized part of the energy is spent in this reorganization and finally the fluorescent will be modified because it's shift at lower energy which is greener fluorescent and this is true for spectra but it's also true for lifetime it changed the lifetime too right so this is a very sensitive proof that gregorio synthesized and give different you know r groups here in order to give specificity to different environment in proteins and in membranes and in particular we will rely on the laurdan which is a lauryl group that give a strong strong interaction with membrane and this is a model that was proposed by tiziana parasasi and enrico in the 90s that was called the cavity model in which the laurdan is located in a location in the membrane that can sense only few water molecules at the interface and this water molecule has some constraint in the rotational time so the what the water at the interface can rotate very very slow because it's interacting with the moieties that they have around and what we have here is a reporter of the physical state of the membrane membrane can change very easily you know they are very sensitive to thermodynamics so temperature uh, ionic strength uh, i don't know ph uh, pressure can change their the order and if they change the order will change the spectra or the lifetime of the fluorescent molecule and this is an example of lower than in membranes and if you increase the temperature you see the spectra start from this black curve here and end up in this green brown so you have a strong shift more than 30 40 nanometer spectral shift stock shift which is very very important so how we did the analysis in the early days well enrico introduced this generalized polarization function which is the polarization you know uh, equation that they show us yesterday but in that case we don't use polarizers we use only two bands of emission and then we operated them using the polarization equation uh, and if we do so we can measure the gp and this is very useful and it was very useful in cubet and even in membranes in, in images and these are GUVs from my friend uh, uh luis pagatoli uh who spent a lot of time doing this uh shiny annular mirror vesicles and if you label these vesicles with laurdan and you have microscope to observe you can see changes in the environment of the of the lipid domains because of the change of the organization physical state of organization member but uh, what is the problem with the gp the gp is already assuming a model what is the model the model is this you have two components right you can be in this state or this state if you have any other component it will not show up here because the equation is only have two parameters 
And this can be a problem when you have third component like, I don't know, autofluorescence or a third fluorophore, whatever, right? So we propose to use the spectral phaser for this. And I will try to demonstrate to you how easily it can be analyzing you know, complex data using the spectral phase. So this was part of my PhD thesis using qubits, and I prepared vesicles with different phospholipids. The OPC is, is, uh, is fluid at the temperature of the experiment, so it's very relaxed. And the PPC is rigid, it's solid. So if you mix both of them, you will have a mixture of fluid and shell domains. If you increase cholesterol, this can be very complex. You can go from fluid shell to liquid order, but in the middle you will have mixture of fluid, shell, liquid order, etc. These are different uh, physical state of membrane. And if you me measure the spectra and you calculate the GP, you see that the behavior you get is sort of a complex, right? You have like a sinusoidal shape. And if you want to explain this, you need to propose a physical model, right? That include all this information, etc. But at some point, you will be guessing. However, if we look at the spectral phaser, you see that everything came in a line, which means that you are always going from one environment to another, so fluid to order. And what is changed is the proportion between the components. So this is the reason for why all the points are in the line, right? Is this always true with lipids? Well, it's not. And this is another example this was part also of my PGT thesis working in Quebec, where the pulmonarizer factor, which is a very complex uh, um, uh, mixture of lipid and proteins that can have around 100 lipids and at least four proteins, the pulmonarizer factor and protein. When you do the phase transition using Laurent, you increase temperature and you calculate the GP, you again got some sort of a transition phase curve of GP. And if you want to model this, okay, again, you need to propose a model going from fluid to liquid order. There are, you know, these physical states, etc. But with the phasor plot, you see that immediately this come up with a list uh, with with a, with a trajectory which is out of the linear combination, which is a straight line. So for me, it was very useful because I immediately can tell well, this is different of just two lipids. It's something else, and there is an extra component here that I cannot explain with a simple model, right? So by looking at the data, it's quite easy and, uh, and straightforward to understand. And the next example is also part of uh, uh, an early day work that I, that I did with the, with, the, um, with the lamellar bodies, which is the organelle to, um, to storage the pulmonary surfactant at the lung. So in the pneumonocyte type two in the lung. And, you know, it has a very, you know, complicated path of maduration from the Golgi apparatus to the release in the epithelial lining fluid. Uh, and then this organelle, which are called the lamellar body, has previous stages like the multivesicular bodies, composite bodies, mature labo lamellar bodies, and then the discrete version of the lamellar bodies. By the time that we were doing this work, there was this communication from colleagues in, in Spain that shows that the organization of the lamellar body was very packed and dehydrated, and they proposed to have a solid state like, you know, shell phases. They were using GP, and it was, you know, uh, uh, um, in some way, well, what we uh, knew at that point. But we were doing phasers. And the first thing that we, we, we need to prove at this point was we were using, you know, immortalized cells that produce pulmonary surfactant. And the first thing that we need to do, we need to prove that these, you know, vesicles that we, we, we saw here were, you know, lamellar bodies because there can be others, you know, uh, lamellar structure inside the cell. So I found, you know, a, a, a collaborator uh, that gave me, you know, a molecular marker. This is the ABC A3 transporter, which is the responsible for loading the lamellar bodies uh, with phospholipids. So I did the tram transfection of the my cells, and I can see, well, yes, these these are my organelles. But the next question was, okay, but can you tell me that when you are will be measuring, you know, the fluorescent from the Laurent to understand the physical state of these organelles are the same. 
So, well, the answer is you will need to co-label Laurdan with me, my molecular marker. Unfortunately for me, I was not a molecular biology, and the position of the EGFP fluorescent in the phasor was in the line of the linear combination we got for the Laurdan within the lamellar bodies. So I can tell that there is, you know, a coincidence between the lamellar bodies and the uh, uh, molecular marker, but I cannot tell more about with which part of the linear combination of the Laurdan. So the organization is fluid, is solid, is something else. So I, I couldn't tell. And I say that, unfortunately, it was not a molecular biology because in another situation, I will switch the fluorescent protein and put the fluorescent protein in another place in the spectral phason, and the shop, the shop was done. But I, it was not under my skills. I was, a, you know, I am a biophysicist, so I try to rely on the tools that I have. And I overcome to, you know, uh, show to the reviewers that this was the case. So I thought, okay, well, Laurdan doesn't work, but if I have another dye that can do the same job or similar job of Laurdan, eventually I can combine this molecular marker with this new dye. In, if, if I can prove that Laurdan works similar of what this secondary dye uh, does, well, this will solve the solution. So I labeled my cells with Laurdan, and the trajectory for Laurdan is this. You have unrelaxed Laurdan and relaxed Laurdan, so a membrane with high order or a membrane with more relaxed structure. And then I labeled with Nile Red, which is a lipid free dye. And you see that there is another trajectory here, which is perfect for a combination with my molecular marker, which was here. But now I co label. And the question was, what is the solution? Well, the spectral phasor told me that these two dyes work similar because if you can see, there is a linear combination between the unrelaxed of Laurdan and unrelaxed of Nile Red and unrelaxed of Laurdan and relaxed of Nile Red. And these are, you know, the pixel showing the trajectory of the two linear combination. So now I use the secondary marker, the Nile Red, in order to prove to which kind of environment the, 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 the molecular marker was co-labeling and the lamellar body was uh, interacting. So basically, I use all this tool and I use all of this example because this was a great example of how much power can be, you know, this linear combination to explain something that switching a fluorescent protein will, was, a, was a minute, right? But it's a really nice example. You see now, and now I have my trajectory of Nile Red, and then I have linear combination with a different fraction of, you know, of the molecular marker. And this is the order side, and you see here in, in violet, my lamellar bodies here, and then other structures. And then you have here, you see, uh, the linear combination with the other part of the cell. So with that, we, we proved that, you know, we were studying the same organelle with the Laurdan, with the Nile Red, and then we prove the molecular identity of this organelle. But after that, you know, we 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 continue using Laurdan for many other things, and Laurdan has a very complicated photophysics, and the complication in photophysics came because there are things that happen not only in space, but also in time. And what, what I mean from that, you know, when the Laurdan is in the membrane, and the membrane can change, you know, in a physical parameter, this molecular, you know, uh, this this water molecule that are around, you know, can change, you know, the rotation, and the time that take to, you know, reorient can change also with the physical parameter that you have in the membrane, the thermodynamic state of the membrane. So the combination of lifetime and spectra is very valuable because you can take from one the resolution of the lifetime and see if there is something outside universal cycle or thing like that. And you can use the spectra to see if these are changing. So you can combine many dimensions. So this was one of the early projects that I did at the LFD with Enrico, in which we want to combine many dimensions, many lifetime, many spectra, uh, using the phaser. And the logic is, is the following. So if you have an image, which is a microscope that can do spectra and lifetime at the same time or sequentially, but very quickly. 
in a pixel you will have information from, from a spectra and a decay from the last time. If you do the transformation, right, you will obtain a spectral phasor and then a lifetime phasor. But these two phasors are connected and they are connected through this pixel because the information that is here came from the same pixel. So I can use the reciprocity principle of, of, the, of the phasors to select a region of each interest in my, in my phasor and show where are those pixels in my image. And then I can select those pixels in my image and say where they are in the secondary phasors. And this is, is, is a method that we developed together with Enrico and it's very useful and it allows us to understand much in depth how was Laudan interacting in the different subcellular organization. And we can correlate, you know, for instance, the spectra changes with lifetime. And you see this is the blue emission of the of the of the Laudan, which is basically the blue channel for the GP calculation. And then we have a green channel, which is the second channel for the GP, which is 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 intended to see the part that is relaxed, right? Is relaxed after you know uh, before emission, right? And you can see that this is a little bit outside your universal cycle, and this is because you know there is dipolar relaxation going on here. And if we measure, you know, this, we can access to the polarity to the dipolar relaxation at the same time, and through the Connection with multi-dimension is very, very powerful technique to understand in depth the complex photophysics of dice like the Laudan. But then uh, we keep pushing with the understanding of, you know, environment and uh, organization of membrane. And we were, you know, already able to do three components. And this was a paper with, with Michelle and Michelle's student, Sarah Sameni, where I helped in use the phasor and the combination with third component to give identity, a molecular identity for an extra organelle. So if you have the line for the phasor, right, for the Laudan, so you have orga order fluid and you put a third component as I showed before, you can see in the trajectory between the all the linear combination if some pixels that are more order are associated to um, molecular marker, I don't know, in an organelle, in the plasma membrane, or in someone else, to understand only the membrane environment from this region and not for the whole cell. Because if you look at the cells, you see that the laudan will label the whole cell. You cannot discriminate from where the laudan is coming, right? So with this approach, it was fine. We can do it, but we can do only for one organelle. So we can co-label laudan with one organelle because the amount of equation we have here up to three components. But in a collaboration with Floris Arigoin and Paolo Arepanto and Alex Bagnishana, we developed an evolution of this. And the evolution of this was the use of harmonic. You remember that in the calculation, we can change this number here between one, two, three, and we have more revolutions in this Fourier transformation and we can get extra set of equations. What it means is that we can obtain extra part, extra uh, equation that enable us to go for more components. And in that case, we will be able to co-label Laudan with more organelles. And we did it up to three co-labeling. So we did it up to Laudan and three more organelles, and I will show in a minute. But what is the logic? If you have three five spectra here and you mix it in different proportion, like two component or three component, if you have a point here, you see that it's, it's going to be difficult to identify if this belongs to a linear combination of two component or three component because it's in the center of the two trajectories, right? The three component or the two component. But if you calculate the second harmonic, you see that the combination for the three component is outside of this point. And this is only displayed for two component. So higher harmonic give you more information about what is composed your sample and give you the chance to go in this in, in, in depth and understand uh, and use for this multiple combination. So basically we acquire uh, a spectra from many different fluorophores, Hodge, Laudan, Golgi, Laudan, 
in Relax and Not Relax, Diso Tracker, Mito Tracker, Nucred, Cell Mask. And then we calculate, you know, these are many cells. We calculate, we calculate, no, we transform the data in the first harmonic, second harmonic, and third harmonic. And then with that information, we did all the analytical solution of the phasor in order to un unmix and understand, you know, how was the organization of membrane. So the first challenge that we did was basically co-labeling with five, five dyes. Uh, and, 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 and you can see here, well, this is Hodge and this is Lyso Tracker and then Golgi, Mito Tracker and Cell Mask. And you can see that there are some pure pixels here in each component, but some of them has a little bit of each one, a little bit of each component. So with the algorithm, we can generate fraction of photon for component one, two, three, four. And you already start to see that this belong to nucleus, this belong to the lysosome, this belong to the um, Golgi apparatus, this belong to the mitochondria, and this to the plasma membrane. And if you do the rational by the number of photon or the fraction of photon multiplied by the intensity, you can make images of the individual component you have pixel by pixel and you generate five sub-images with the unmixing of all the components very easily and very straightforward. And with that, you can regenerate your image, which is homogeneous, you know, in color at the first time, but now you can have, you know, independent color by color of all the images. And the, the, the very interesting here is, you know, if you trace a line here, you can see that you have the sensitivity even to see, you know, uh, something very small like like the lysosome or or the mitochondria. So you you can really will not be you know biased for the you know for the big or small is your object. Y you can recompose the spectra and the fraction you have in each of them. Uh, but we wanted to do for Laurdan and for Laurdan we have the trajectory of Laurdan here and then two three more component Golgi, mitochondria and nucleus and we did, you know, the uh, photon fraction and then the photon number, and you can immediately see that we can split, you know, Golgi apparatus, mitochondria, and plasma membrane. And by doing so, we obtained the information of Laurdan, and then for the first time, we were able of using the same probe to measure the dynamic of membrane at subcellular for many different organelles at the same time. And this is something really important because you can use dyes that can go, you know, to here or there and measure the, you know, organization of membrane. But the problem is most of the time when you tag a dye with a particular group to go to one place or another, you modify the, you know, condition of the, you know, your reporter. And eventually the comparison between, I don't know, the information in the mitochondria will be not fair with the plasma membrane. But Laurdan is homogeneous distribute in all the membranes and the uh, 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 the output so the fluorescent that you obtain does not is not get biases by you know the organelle where it is so this was you know a very nice method that we developed together and it show how powerful can be you know the spectral phasor uh, to to analyze this kind of information so far we get to five component but if you have you know another good two components that can be you know organized in your space in the phaser you can add m two more and have seven and with the third harmony you can get another set of two equation and finally you can get uh, the solution so in principle you can combine louder than up to five extra components so you can i don't know label mitochondria lyso tracker golgi apparatus plasma membrane and one more i don't know reticulum duplasmic and doing all together and obtain the information of the membrane for each of them by using this approach. Finally, what I want to mention is about this idea of doing hyperspectral imaging. I'm not going to spoil in depth, you know, this because I know that Sasha is going to tell more tomorrow, but I just want to share the concept. So I say that when we do, you know, the, the uh, spectral phasor analysis, we acquire an image with the spectra in the T dimension, in the third dimension. And then we do, we apply this mathematic in order to transform the data and obtain, you know, the phaser. But if you think about, Enrico came up with this idea, in which if you 
make the light pass through a filter which has a transmission profile which is sort of a sine or a cosine function in principle you are doing the mathematic operation of the numerator of the spectral phase of transformation so if you have filters that can do you know this and you collect the intensity of the sine and the cosine function and the total intensity you can do the mathematics and do the spectral phase of transformation on optics not in mathematics and by doing so you only need to collect three steps not the 30 something right and this is uh, you know some application we did uh, with Sasha together of using you know beads that are with different color this is easy you know these are the the green these are the orange but this is more complicated and it was uh, you know uh, attempting to demonstrate that this technique can also be comparable with flim so these are you know a, a piece of a femur in, in mice and if it has different collagen uh, parts and if you have different collagens um, you can have different lifetime but also different spectra and you see here that we can separate more or less in the same way that we attempt for lifetime for spectra so with that i want to say that as as the case of the of the lifetime phasor the spectral phasor are are very nice tool for hyperspectral imaging it can be associated with molecular species and and this is for me the most important part besides of the mixing it can work very well with the mixing but honestly speaking the mixing you know methods are very good on the mix because you have even more information in the spectral phase and analysis we only have three equations for three components right in the the mixing you have the number of channels you have the number of channel the number of equation you have in the, the mixing model so you are really precise when you do you know a mixing with a mixing methods uh but we did the comparison and in one of the paper we did all the you know this comparison between spectral phase and and, and and linear mixing because a reviewer asked and it's, it's, it was very nice to learn that yes, this method when you are comparing, you know, predictable spectra, they are very good. You know, they are very, very, very good. And only in situation where you have very few photon or many more photon, we can bet. You know, the the method. Uh, well, it can it can be used in combination uh, with the all the linear combination for two component, many components as I mentioned, two, three. Uh, you can combine with other dimensions like multidimensional phasor and the sine and cosine filter are very useful and you will see that how powerful this can be for condition where you have scattering photons which is very hard to do hyperspectral imaging in high scattering sample so again i i hope i can convince you that the phasor are cool and again i hope i can convince you to jump in this new dimension thank you